Um, to get straight in, could we maybe briefly recap for our audience what has happened in recent history and what is currently happening in Korea? And I have the, the, the images you picked um, with me, so just let me know whenever you want to share them. Okay, well, thank you for having me. I am delighted to be here. Um, and thank you, especially to you for your hard work for making all of this happen. Well, that question that you asked, um, you know, a brief recap of the Korean history. You know, I asked that very same question to my father over and over again, more than 100 times as I was growing up. And he would get really annoyed at me because he had to repeat himself again and again. Um, <clears throat> But uh, I am not going to pretend that, you know, uh, I am going to summarize the history of division of Korea in five minutes. What I can tell you is that um, unlike uh, what most uh, people or a lot of people think, uh, Korea was uh, uh, divided before the Korean War in 1950. Uh, already in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, there was an ideological division because uh, uh, capitalism had come from Europe, communism had come from Russia, and there were these uh, uh, conflicting ideologies flourishing all over the continent uh, already at the beginning of the 20th century. And before you know, in 1910, Japan colonizes Korea, and Korea remains colonized by Japan for 35 years. Finally, in 1945, uh, after the end of the World War II, um, we get liberated and uh, we think, okay, now we have freedom. Now, but, well, guess what? <laughs> um, the, the country was too weak to govern itself. And um, uh, what happens when the country can't control its fate? Well, the neighboring countries take care of you. So uh, Russia and China started luring over the country. Um, the US and the UN started eyeing on the country as well. They couldn't make up their mind. Um, so they just decided they would just draw a line in the middle uh, on the 38th parallel. And that became South Korea and it became North Korea, <laughs> simply. Um, so then, but the country was divided. We each had our government, one in the North, one in the South. So we thought, okay, now uh, we, we are going to um, do a better job at uh, looking after our country. Well, not really, because five years later in 1950, uh, it's the Korean War. The North invades the South, North being backed up by Russia invades the South. And um, there were something like 5 million casualties, I think. Um, in 1953, there's an armistice that is signed but the peace treaty was never signed. Till today, it remains unsigned. So technically we're still at war with one another. So let me fast forward a little bit here because there's so much to say, but uh, let's go to 2018 and 2019. We know that President Trump met with Kim Jong-un twice uh, in Vietnam and in Singapore, um, but nothing has uh, come out of it uh, either, uh, as we all know. So then what happens in uh, 2021? Well, we've heard a lot about South Korea lately because of uh, the remarkable job they did about COVID-19 and how they managed to contain it. Um, uh, but we haven't heard much about North Korea. Uh, we haven't heard much about the inter-Korean affairs either. The truth is not much has happened uh, over the last 70 years. Um, there were many attempts to get the two countries closer together, but um, all the attempts uh, failed. We, we came full circle, really. So uh, what does all of that have to do with me? Well, it is that status quo that exasperated me and that pushed me to do the work that I do today. Um, I think I'll stop here for the recap because I could go on and on and it's so complicated. I will never, I will never be able to find an end. <laughs> it's so complex too. I love, yeah, of, of course. I mean, we were just talking before about oversimplification. I think it's a perfect recap. Thank you. Um, and I just also wanted to ask you because I remember you told me that to fight for Korean peace is to fight for world peace. So we're 
group of very international people here. Um, what could you could you sort of just tell me a bit more about this and, and what you mean? Let me explain. When I was a child, every 15th of the month, we had to do what we call the Minbang Mi Hulian, a war training. So every 15th of the month, everybody uh, was super, everybody was hiding inside a building. The cars stopped in the streets. Um, nobody, it became a, a ghost town after we hear the siren. And for 20 minutes, life would stop in the city. Siren would ring again, and then it was back to normal again, uh, normal life again. Um, just to say that I lived all my life with a fear of a war. Till today. You know, we mentioned earlier that we didn't hear much about North Korea lately. Um, certainly from the outside, and uh, I think it has everything to do with um, uh, their enemy number one, the United States, having been distracted with their elections. But now the Trump parenthesis is closed, you know. So what is going to happen next? Nobody knows. All I know is that um, the Biden administration will have to pick it up from where it left it at. Um, back with uh, Clinton and Obama and they were, when they were talking about the strategic uh, patients and, and so forth. Um, and they will have to address the nuclear weapon uh, discussion again. Um, what we don't know or what uh, hasn't been made that public is that the, this Trump, what I call this Trump parenthesis has put North Korea on the international stage. They managed to settle as a very powerful nuclear nation. So for four years, we thought, oh, they're not doing much. Well, guess what? No, they were doing quite a bit. So what does that mean for the world? You can probably guess. North Korea has um, intercontinental ballistic missiles, those famous ICBMs. They also have nuclear submarines, which can reach any continent, including Europe and America. That simply means that no nation on Earth is safe anymore. So it is in that sense that uh, I talked about the Korean, <clears throat> the North Korean nuclear issue not being a Korean issue only anymore. Sadly, unfortunately, um, but that it is concerning um, all of us and it is becoming everybody's issue. After centuries, the West is waking up and a strong group of intellectual and economic leaders are asking themselves how we can benefit from the great economic lessons of the East, South Korea, Singapore, China, Japan, Taiwan. <laughs> how, how can Western leaders move from the stale idea of being dominant leaders to the idea of being multi-talented, multi-talented stewards. If you had to pick your insight, if you have to pick, if you have to pick with your insight three or four characteristics a leader must have, which ones would you pick? And perhaps you can also draw from your own experience on the National Unification Advisory Board. That's a very broad question. So um, let me think. Um, why don't we take the example of the way we handle this uh, uh, sanitary crisis? Um, I think it would be a good way of, um, of explaining through, through a, a concrete case. So uh, when that happened, when the whole crisis exploded back in March, um, you know, I was, uh, I was being a wimp. I flew to Korea. <laughs> you know, I left my poor husband alone here in London and um, I flew to Korea and my children were in Korea as well. So I know I have, I have lived um, the way they handled this crisis there. And I have to say, I felt so safe. Um, but, you know, what becomes a problem here in the Western society is not a problem there um, for, I think, a couple of reasons. First, culturally, 
uh, in a country like Korea, as we have uh, um, seen now through the presentation, we, we, um, we know how to be together in front of an enemy. You know, we lived with this anxiety of war uh, for so many years. Um, when it comes to being together in front of a danger, we know how to do that. Um, so it turns out it was not a military danger, a military war from the north, but it was this virus war. So when there were messages coming out of the, of, of the system, of the government saying, okay, everybody has to wear a mask um, and we are doing this, doing this and doing that, there was no um, metaphysical uh, debates that were needed about that, you know? wear your mask and protect your life. There was no debate about, oh, but uh, that's against my um, right of freedom and that's not against my, that's against my belief. And uh, so uh, if you will, it is a side of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Korean society that a lot of Westerners don't like because they think, okay, well, you know, we don't want to live like you. We don't want to just do whatever the government tells you to do. We don't, we don't want to be robots. We, we are individuals and we are going to do what we want to do. We live in a democratic country. So um, that, that mindset plays against us for some things, but I know played in, uh, in our favor in front of this crisis. So it is really a question of, um, you know, uh, you can't choose and pick, <laughs> you, you, you live with the package, but, um, you know, uh, I feel that times when democracy develops to a certain level, um, the, 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 the fundamental problems all of a sudden are forgotten. You know, the survivals are forgotten. Um, uh, and it, it just takes a reminder to, to, uh, to, to let people know that, uh, you know, it is important to wear a mask, you know? Um, do, do, we, do we know, I mean, is it acceptable that, um, you know, 25 million North Koreans live in the dark today? Um, you know, these, these questions need to be uh, popped up now and then to rebalance a little bit, to shift the priorities um, in, in, in the society. Uh, but when, when you live in a country which was never attacked or, um, you know, like, uh, I don't know, it, it's hard to get that mindset. But because Korea was at such a, and is still today in such a um, uh, hot seat, um, you know, we, we, we have that mentality and, um, that's also how they made this uh, economical miracle for the last uh, 50 years or so. And that's how they became the, the 12th um, you know, uh, economy uh, worldwide uh, today. But um, we, it's all uh, um, good and bad sides uh, in a package, but that served us well for the Corona uh, crisis. Quickly moving on as, um, again, time is flying. Um, Moving to this sort of women, women power that we've been exploring today. Um, what has your experience been like um, working in a government workspace like South Korea as a woman? Well, it has actually been quite fun, I have to say. Um, you know, there are currently 49 members in the UK and um, 23 of them are women. So from a number standpoint, uh, it's a very diverse organization. Having said that, um, I think they were quite surprised to see me um, taking initiative so quickly as soon as I joined on board. Um, uh, you know, I think my private sector experience helped me being efficient and result oriented and so forth. Um, but I think uh, the, the real uh, value that I added, at least this is my, um, it's my uh, the way I see things, is the fact that I was approaching things from a different angle. And I was able to bring fresh idea to the table. And I'm mentioning this because I think it has everything to do with me being a woman, because we just happen to see the world differently. 
we, we, you know, we happen to analyze things differently and, um, uh, and uh, find solution differently and uh, go through um, a, a problem set differently uh, and so forth. And um, it is so essential to mix people, you know, it is so important to have at the same table, men, women, old people, young people, because honestly, the, the, it is the mix that brings the creativity and the innovation and perspective and ideas. So that's the first point I would like to make, you know, yes, bring as many women as you can on the board, on, on the table, they will bring perspective. Um, and then secondly, I would, uh, I would like to maybe mention um, this concept of, uh, of, uh, of empowerment. You know, the reason I was able to add value was because I had this fresh uh, idea that I, I, I was able to bring to the table. When well, why did I have these fresh ideas that I bring to the table? It's because I had a conviction. It's because I had a belief. Um, in, uh, uh, in this case, it is the belief that that I, I, I was able to unify, that unifying North Korean and South Korean citizens was something feasible. That was, uh, that is my, my belief. And um, when you have a, a conviction, uh, you feel important. Not because that I am important, but because you feel that you are the messenger of an important belief. The belief is important, okay? So when the belief is important, that it makes you important. And that's how does this whole process of empowerment, uh, you know, begins. Because it's all nice to say, to talk about uh, theoretically, you know, these big words, empowerment, self-empowerment and so forth, but how does it begin? You know, or, uh, where's the beginning of all of that? And in my case, I can go back to when I was 12 years old, when I was in Cameroon, uh, attending a French lycée called Fustel de Coulanges in Yaoundé. And um, the, my, my teacher of, uh, my biology teacher um, told my father one day, you know, it was the, the parents teachers meeting day. And she told her, you know, I mean, she told him, there's a problem with your daughter. Um, she's way too shy. She, she needs to participate more. She needs to speak more in class. She needs to put up a hand and uh, she needs to uh, be like everybody else and, and speak up a bit. She's way too shy. It's not good. So to that, what does my father answer? He says, well, dear teacher, um, being reserved in our culture is something that is phenomenal. We love reserved people and there is no way on earth I am going to ask her to change. It was so, so, uh, so this is what I mean by empowerment, you know, that, that phrase stayed with me all my life. And, um, you know, I, I was 12 years old feeling insecure because I was told I was too shy and, and worthless. But that, that sentence, you know, um, stayed with me. And uh, until today, when uh, I face difficulties, you, you, you go back to that, you go back to that space. And I am talking about this in the context of being empowered. You know, you don't know when these things happen, but throughout your life, you have these, uh, in, in French, they call this jalon, you have these little things that um, make you who you are. And you go back to that when you feel strongly about it, you know. So um, that was a little anecdote to say, um, uh, you know, perspective is important, conviction is important, and, uh, and, and self-empowerment is important. And a lot of, a lot of what, what you've done in the past few years has, has also been inspired by another amazing woman that entered your life, um, Jean Park. Um, could you tell us a bit about her and a bit about your book, Les Deux Coréennes, which obviously means the two Koreans in French? Yes, of course. I really want to tell you uh, the story of this encounter because it is an encounter that um, six years ago I met uh, Park ji a refugee from North Korea. Um, and a lot of people may not know but we were not supposed to talk to each other. 
um, you know, there is still in South Korea today this national security law, which prevents us from talking to North Koreans. Um, and you can understand why, um, because of the background that uh, the, the, the war and um, all these things happening to, to our country. But I think that when you are not prepared to a situation, and it was the case when I met her, you tend to act on your instinct. And, and that day when I met Jian, I think I happened to have the right one. It was in 2014 and uh, she was being interviewed by Amnesty International. I had to replace a translator who couldn't make it because she was sick. Well, I was just terrified. I was terrified because she was North Korean I was terrified because of the story that she was telling me. Her life story was just simply a harrowing. I had never heard anything like that um, in my entire life. The next day, I called the Korean embassy to say, look, I spent an entire day with a North Korean refugee. I want to, uh, you to know, and I would like you to keep it on the record. And for the three, Following you, the three years that followed that, that, that encounter, I was in a dilemma because my head was saying, don't ever see her again. She's dangerous, she's evil, she's a communist. Don't go near her ever again. And my heart was saying, oh, she speaks the same language, she, she, she looks like you, she um, eats uh, the same food uh, as you. Um, we look like we're about the same age. I'm curious, I'm sort of drawn to her. So there was this dichotomy I couldn't solve for three years. I didn't really, really, really didn't know what to do. And, you know, helping the other can be difficult, at times dangerous. But I think you accept to go the extra mile because something is speaking to you, because the desire of changing the world is speaking to you at that moment, and only at that moment. So you have to catch it when they speak to you. Um, so not easy at all, um, but uh, nevertheless, I accept to write the book in 2017. And that's the year where we saw the missiles um, shooting and so forth. It was a difficult year for me. Uh, I knew I couldn't prevent a war from happening, but I could do something. I could write. I could write a book together with uh, Gian. I couldn't stop the war from happening, but I could make an individual peace with one North Korean. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to show the world that one South Korean was capable of making peace with one North Korean. So we write the book at the first person and it is the two of us, of course, but we wanted to speak with one voice. So in the book, when, I, when it says I, it is her when she speaks about North Korea and it, and it is I, uh, I is me when I speak about South Korea. And uh, we don't really tell a story, or at least I don't think, uh, but rather we show the reader um, a world. We show them a world that is very different. And we, uh, we let them draw their own conclusion. For instance, the book ends in the Gobi Desert in Mongolia. And a lot of people came to see me and said, well, you know, your book is nice, but it feels a bit unfinished. Well, it is unfinished. And that's the way Jian wanted it to be. Jian made it through the Gobi Desert. But what about the others who didn't make it? Are we closing the book and going back to our job and our work and uh, our you know, daily life? I wanted to stop and think a little bit about the human being. 
I wanted to focus on the person behind. And this is the message of the book, the human being. You know, peace with North Korea is possible if we start at an individual level. A pol purely political approach is, a, is completely missing the point because peace doesn't happen at the North South summit. You know, it happens only via personal experiences, only via personal experiences. And that's when togetherness comes to light and gives us hope.